from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Of her was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. When his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found with child through the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, since he was a righteous man, yet unwilling to expose her to shame, decided to divorce her quietly. Such was his intention when, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary, your wife, into your home, for it is through the Holy Spirit that this child has been conceived in her. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. When Joseph awoke, he did as the angel of the Lord has commanded him, and took his wife into his home. And this is the gospel of the Lord. So I always love when, um, you know, at, at Christmas time, we hear that same opening gospel a lot of times, but it's the, it's the whole um, genealogy, you know, it's where it goes, it has, it starts off with, um, Abraham became the father of Isaac, Isaac became the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and it goes down. And sometimes when I first heard it, like I mean, when I first read it and, and would hear it at mass when I was a kid, I was like, oh my gosh, this is mind numbing. Like it's just, who? I don't understand. But then, I mean, then you get to know the Bible story and you realize all these characters, and you might, you might not know all of them, but you know that what these are like, this is a big deal. Like when they say these names, and you know the story attached to the person's name, it, it becomes something different. And I always have this image then, whenever we hit Christmas and we go through the genealogy, um, I have this image like a movie trailer. So just go with me on this one. I mean, you don't have to, but just um, imagine a black screen, right? And then every time there's a name, it's like, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, with that kind of like that real big bass, you know, kind of a dubstep kind of a thing. And then as it gets further and further along, it kind of gets, there's like a drum in the back, and it gets going faster and faster and louder and louder, and then it gets to like, and Joseph, and then like, Jesus, you know, I'm like, that's awesome. So every time at Mass, I'm like, during Christmas, I get all antsy at that, mo at that moment. Because there's something about this, there's something about when Jesus comes on the scene, there's he's someone we never expected. When Joseph comes on the scene, it's someone we never expected. I mean, there's so many people's stories in here that if you were to write the story of how is God going to save the world, I would not use these people. Like last night we talked about David. Here's, here's this, yeah, he's a king, but he's also an adulterer and a murderer. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to use him. Or his, or his uh, great-grandmother, Rahab, who was a prostitute. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to use her in the story of how God's going to save the world. Here's the story of Judah, who's, who had child by Tamar, who was actually his daughter-in-law, who pretended to be a prostitute in order to get her father-in-law to sleep with her, to have kids. Like, I'm not sure I'm going to use that story and how to save the world, you know? And then even we have this story of Jesus. Here's Joseph. And, he, and here's the wife, his betrothed Mary, who is not his, it's conceived not with his child. I'm not sure if I'm going to use that story. And there's something about Something about like parenthood that when it comes to like these stories that you get, and it just here's a quick thing. Um, a couple of Christmases ago, I, I get to come home, I get to go home for a lot of Christmases because the students are gone, and in my hometown, they need help because uh, they have like thousand masses on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And they always, since I'm the guy who's not, I don't, I don't get to be part of the hey, what mass do you want to take for Christmas? They always give me the kids' mass. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Not because I don't like kids. I love kids. But sometimes, you know, that's the mass they have, like, the pageant at. And it's one of those where I'm just, 
Like, I, okay, that's fine. It's great. And a couple years ago, before that mass, before I was assigned to that mass, my parents, my whole family were sitting at my, my parents' house. We were watching that kids' mass from years before that, where my little sister, who at that point was married, she had a child of her own, where she was in it as like a little kid. And of course, the, the, the VCR, the camcorder, was out completely out of focus. And it was not even pointing at anybody we knew, you know? And then at one point, it was funny, because at one point it became in focus on my sister at the very moment that she turned to her best friend standing next to her and went like, you know, like, like that's the one thing we saw in focus in the entire, of the entire pageant. But it's funny because I, you think about this, when, when, if your kid is in the pageant, you don't want to take pictures of all of the kids. You want to take a picture of your kid. Like, you don't care about, like, are all the other children in the frame? Are all the other kids in focus? Like, you don't, that doesn't matter. All that matters is if your child is in the frame, if your child is in focus. Because, I mean, there are other, there are other kids, and they're wonderful, but they're not my child. And so I don't care about them in the same way that I care about my own child. And there's something about that that just is, is reveals something to us. Because your chi- children to you are not just nice. To you, your children are more than nice. Your children are, are they're, lack of a better word, are, they're precious to you. Now, Lord of the Rings has kind of corrupted that word, so you think, they're precious. But like, your children are, are unique. I mean, so unique that as we were watching that, that video, at one point, again, we couldn't see anything because this is my dad's, one of his first forays with the world of VCR technology or, or recorder technology. We could just hear a voice. And I remember saying, is that Sarah? My sister. And her husband was like, oh yeah, that's Sarah. Like, he, he didn't know her until like three years, four years before this, but her little Sarah voice, her husband is so attuned to that, like, oh no, no, that's Sarah. Why? Because she is his beloved, and even if he can't see her, he knows and recognizes her voice. And this is something so important, because this is how you are to God. That one of these things is like, you're not just a face in the crowd when it comes to God. You're not just one voice among many when it comes to God. That when it comes to God, you are his beloved. That you are completely, 100% known. That you're, in, cer- in a certain sense, you would say you're, you're precious to him, you're dear to him. And this question then is this, is if that's how we are to God, how is God to us? Like if that's how we are to God, that he, we are completely his beloved and he accepts us as we are. He loves us. He doesn't love the idea of you. He loves the actual you. Because, again, those of you who are parents, you know this. You might, had, you might have had, when, when you carried your child in your womb, or when your wife carried your child or your children in their womb, you might have had an idea of how, they, how they'd be. You might have had an idea of this is who they would be, this is who, the kind of personality they have. They'll like all the same things I like, and they'll have the same temperament that I have, and they'll just be like, here's how they're going to be. And then they're born, and they're themselves. <laughs> and they're not necessarily who you thought they would be. And you have a decision. Will I let them be them? Or will I make them be the child I want them to be? That's a really big question. Will I let them be them? Or will I try to make them be the child that I wanted them to be? Um, If you go back to the Old Testament, in uh, the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 34, there's this story of, it says that Moses... This is after Exodus 32. In Exodus Exodus 32, what happens is this. Moses goes up the mountain, right? And he gets the tablets of stone with the commandments on them. And it says in Exodus 32 that God himself carved the tablets out of rock and that God himself wrote the commandments on the tablets. But we know what happened. We know what happened is that Moses came down the mountain and the Israelites were there at the base of the mountain and they were worshiping God. But they had created a God in their own image. We know the story of the golden calf, right? So God, just to recap, for those of you who skipped that Sunday Sunday at Sunday school, um, God set the Israelites free from slavery in Egypt. They go through the Red Sea. They get to this place, Mount Sinai. Moses goes up the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. God's going to make a covenant with them that he's their God. They're his people. 
And while Moses is gone, the people down at the base of the mountain, they say, Aaron, Moses' brother, Aaron, make for us a golden calf so we can worship it. And what they do is they make the golden calf, but then they say something really unique. In Exodus 32, they say, this, O oh Israel, this is the Lord your God. This is the God who saved you. You know, sometimes we think that, oh, they, they turned away from the God who set them free, and they turned to our golden calf. That's not the case. They made a golden calf, and they said, this is the God who saved you. They think that that's Yahweh. And they formed Yahweh in their own image. They said, this is how we want God to be. They didn't think that they were leaving the real God. They just said, we're going to make him how we want him. Moses comes down the mountain, of course, and sees this and, and you know, throws the stone tablets to the ground. And he goes back up the mountain. Now, this is interesting. In Exodus 34, he goes back up the mountain to re-get, re-obtain the Ten Commandments. But this time, it's different. In the first time he got the Ten Commandments, it was God himself who carved the stones out of the rock. In Exodus 34, Moses goes back up the mountain, and he's already carved these tablets. And he walks up the mountain with blank tablets. And that's an image, this walking up the mountain with blank tablets, is I just think a fantastic image of how we are to approach God. Sometimes we approach God with the idea of, God, here's how you're going to be. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to be like. So when I approach you, it's kind of like the Israelites at the base of the mountain. No, God, I know you're good. And I know all these other things about you. But ultimately, I'm making you the way I want you to be. Sometimes we approach worship in the same way. We say, okay, God, this is how it's going to be. This is how I'm going, I'm going to get to worship you. I'm going to worship you how I want to worship you. And then when it comes to, like, worship is then I form it rather than it forms me. And then I invent a God rather than I receive a God. Now, how many times do we do this? How many times do you find, we find ourselves, we'll talk about this later tonight, at the second Mass of the day. Also, you can come to that second Mass tonight. Um, you can receive communion twice a day, so there you go. Um, we're going to talk about this tonight, about this whole recognition of, do I form worship or do I let worship form me? Do I invent a God or do I let him reveal himself to me? Moses, when he goes up the mountain with blank tablets, basically he's saying, God, you get to say who you are. God, I give you permission. These blank, these tablets are blank and that you get to tell me who you are. Kind of like when your kids were born. There's sometimes that fight of like, no, 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 no. You're going to be like this. And you have to say, if you're going to love your kids, if you're going to really love them, you have to be able to say, I'm going to let you be who you are, and I'm going to love the you that I get. Just like when we approach the Lord, say, God, you get to be who you are. Why? Because your kids are real. They're real people. They're real persons. And actually, so is God. He is a real person, or trinity of persons. And he gets to tell us who he is, and he gets to tell us how to worship him. And what's one of the things that God says? What's one of the things that God says is just crazy. He, God says his name is I am. In Exodus, God reveals himself. He's I am. I am who am. God, you get to speak. Tell me who you are. And he says, I am. And ultimately, in the rest of the scriptures, we get it's revealed to us that God reveals that he is a trinity. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. You say, okay, what does that mean? Well, that means this. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that in Jesus Christ, God reveals his innermost secret. And I always wonder, like it actually says that. It says, in Jesus, God reveals his innermost secret. So I remember pausing at that moment and saying, oh my gosh, this is huge. Like, wouldn't you want to know the innermost secret of God? It's kind of a big deal. Like, three of you might. So I'm going to tell the, you three. Um, you're like, yes, whatever. Um, we already know this. It says in the Catechism, God's innermost secret is that he is an eternal exchange of love. Now, I remember reading that in the Catechism going like, oh, like wah, wah. Like that's so anticlimactic. Like that's God's innermost secret, that he's an eternal exchange of love. But then I thought about it and realized, oh my gosh, this it's actually is mind-blowing. This is world-changing. This is life-shattering. Why? Because if God is a trinity, if God is eternal, 
God's innermost secret is he is an eternal exchange of love, which means this, that love isn't just something God does. Love is what God is. Love isn't something just God does. Love is what God is. Who here is made in the image and likeness of God? Most of you. So yes, exactly. So if God's innermost secret is he's an eternal exchange of love, that's how he reveals himself. He is love. And you're made in God's image. What does that say about the innermost secret of you? What does that say about what you're made for? What's that say about who you are? That means you are made. You are made for love. That's why John Paul II said, without love, man remains a being incomprehensible to himself. If he doesn't experience love, and I'm not talking romance, I mean, if he doesn't experience any kind of love, then he remains a mystery to himself. Because if God's innermost secret is he is love, and you're made in God's image, that means that you essentially are made for love. You know, God's job, if God is love, that means also one big thing, that he doesn't need us. Sometimes we have this image, right, that, that like God was like, he was just somewhere and nothing was created and he was just kind of like, I'm lonely. How about I make some angels? Those are fun. And then he's like, I'm bored with the angels. How about I make a world, like, you know, make people? Like, oh, that's fun. Like, God has never been lonely. So what that means is this, God didn't need you. He didn't need to make you. And this, I think this is a really big revelation that sometimes we don't pay attention to. God does not need you. Now, at first that can be like, seriously, Father, why are you beating us up like this? <laughs> that God does not need you. I remember I have a priest friend who said that when he, when he was younger, his dad sat he and his two brothers down for like the talk. And the talk was the priorities talk. And his dad said, sons, these three boys, I need you to know your dad's priorities. He, I need you to know what I value the most. And he said, number one is God. Number two is your mother. You boys are number three. I remember telling that to a group of people and they were like, oh, that's sad. But this, this, this priest, he said, actually, that was so great for he and his, he and his brothers. He said, because one of the things it meant was that like, we're not number one in my dad's life. We're not number two in our dad's life. We're number three. Think of how many parents define themselves by their kids' successes or failures. How many parents define themselves by whether their kids turn out great or they don't turn out great. And he said, me and my brothers, we were free from that. We actually, because our dad didn't need us, because he, he, and he lived this way. He said our dad lived, God was first. Our mom was so precious in his eyes. She was number two. We were number three. We were, because we were number three, we were free to fail. Our dad didn't need us, so we were free to fail and still be loved because he didn't need to love us. He chose to love us. And the same thing is true when it comes to God. God doesn't need you. He chooses you. God didn't need to make you. He wants you to be alive. I mean, just think about that. God did not need you, and he does not need you, but you are. What does that mean? That means he wants you to be. He wants to love you. Sometimes, I mentioned this the other night, sometimes we can think that God loves y'all, but he doesn't love y'all. He loves you individually. Well, yeah, but God loves everyone. You know what? You didn't have to exist. You only exist because he wants you to exist, desperately wants you to exist. He doesn't need you. So in that case also, you are also free to fail. And when you fail, that doesn't destroy his love for you. It doesn't destroy those blank tablets. You know, it's interesting. When commencement season rolls around, you know, people graduate, almost every commencement speech is like, hey, you guys, go out and do something great. Go out and do something big. Go out and do something and make your life worthwhile. And it's all about two things. It's all about doing, and it's all about you. And see, how many students go into a career because they say, um, this is where I will flourish? As opposed to asking the question or making the statement, where can I help the most people? Where can I help other people to flourish? How can I help the most people? How can I help 
other people to flourish? How can I bring the gospel into the world? This is the last thing. A lot of these thoughts of just being able to say, in the first place, here is a God I didn't expect in Jesus. But he's the God we get. Here's a child who came into your life, and regardless of who you thought they might be, here's the real child, and you get the choice. Will you love the real child or just your image and idea of the child? When we approach worship, we approach God on our own terms. Do we shape worship or does it shape us? And just this image this morning of like when we approach God, do we approach him with blank tablets and say, God, you get to tell me who you are? Or do we say, no, 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 God. You're going to be the God that I want you to be. You're going to be a God in my image. I'm not in your image. I think that's the big challenge for so many of us in our love is sometimes we find it hard to love our parents because they're not the parents we wanted. So we get to choose. Will we love them? Sometimes it is hard to love your spouse because you're not the spouse I thought you'd be. I get to choose. You're the spouse I have. Well, I love you. And sometimes even that's a Sometimes even there's a challenge of, you're not the child that I thought you'd be, but I'm going to choose to love you. Let's bring that same idea to God. You might not be the God that I would have invented, but you're the God who is. You might not be the God, Jesus, whom I created, but you're the one who created me. And this might not be the worship that I formed. But you guys, at the Mass, this is the worship that forms us. And we have a choice to choose to love this God and to choose to enter into this worship and be formed by it. For the Spirit and the Bride say Yeah, the spirit and the bride take.